Hello, and thank you for joining us today for Fish and Richardson's litigation webinar series. My name is Aisha Bondavadtai, and today Katie Prescott, Kane Day, and I will present Trade Secrets Developments in 2018. Katie, Kane, and I are all attorneys in Fish's Silicon Valley office, and each of us do a fair amount of trade secret litigation. So the issues we'll be discussing today are all near and dear to each of us. Our biographies, the presentation, and the New York, New Jersey blank CLE form are available for download on your control panel. Please note that you must be logged into the webinar on your device in order to receive CLE credit. Today's webinar will run for one hour, and it does include a question and answer period at the end of the program. You may ask questions at any time throughout the program in the questions area of your control panel, and we'll do our best to answer all of them at the end of the presentation, time permitting. Please also feel free to contact us personally after the webinar. When we get to our last slide, you'll see that we've provided our contact information. And before we get started, I should remind you that the content of this presentation is for educational purposes only and does not necessarily reflect the opinions of Fish and Richardson and is also not intended to address every court or specific case scenario. And with that, we can get started. Some of the things that you'll hear about today. We'll talk about ex parte seizures of property, which are authorized under the Defend Trade Secrets Act if a court deems that one is appropriate though it's a rather drastic provision, as we'll talk about. My colleague, Katie Prescott, will talk about trade secret identification, and in particular, how specific an identification needs to be, what the courts are looking for. And my colleague, Kane Day, will talk about damages, and specifically, monetary damages. We can go on to the next slide. And actually, let's go ahead and move on to the next slide after that. So the clause of the DTSA that authorizes ex parte seizures refers to property necessary to prevent the propagation of or dissemination of the trade secret. Property in this context includes laptop computers, mobile devices, paper documents, computer hard drives, basically any physical item that might contain allegedly stolen trade secrets. One thing to note about this is that an application for an ex parte seizure order is subject to a seizure hearing within seven days. So this is a globally unique policy. It's hard to find one that's quite similar to this. We can move on to the next slide. Now, of course, due to the drastic nature of this remedy, the statute provides us very useful guidelines ex parte seizures are authorized only in extraordinary circumstances. So what does extraordinary circumstances mean? We can go on to the next slide. For a plaintiff, extraordinary circumstances means that the plaintiff has a bit of an uphill battle. The plaintiff has to describe with reasonable particularity what is to be seized and where on the defendant's property or at the defendant's location it's located, which means the plaintiff is assumed to have this specific knowledge about the defendant. The plaintiff can't publicize the requested seizure, and the plaintiff has to provide the court with security for any damages the defendant or related third parties might suffer if the court later decides that um, the seizure shouldn't have been granted. Going on to the next slide. The plaintiff also has to arrange for the logistics of the actual seizure. And that includes arranging for a US Marshal who's actually gonna do the physical seizing, arranging for an independent technical expert to accompany the US Marshal because the plaintiff or plaintiff's counsel can't go with the Marshal, arranging for any practical necessities with respect to the seizure itself. So that includes a locksmith, transportation service, substitute custodian, preparing contracts between the court and the experts that might accompany the U.S. Marshal, and scheduling pre-seizure briefing. 
And all of this has to be kept in mind when the plaintiff is identifying with reasonable particularity what is to be seized. Because in scope, the seizure may be very limited. The court could limit the seizure to one eight-hour day and will very likely limit the seizure to the defendant's property only, not third-party property as well. Going on to the next slide. So what's new with ex parte seizures? Not a whole lot. The truth is that even if we're looking at the entire time the DTSA has been in effect, not much has happened. Only a handful of ex parte seizure orders have been issued since the law went into effect, and no federal appellate decisions have addressed ex parte seizures, so we don't have the benefit of that guidance. Going on to the next slide. The case that has been since about 2016 and continues to be today the most widely cited ex parte seizure order is Mission Capital Advisors versus Romaca, which came out of the Southern District of New York. And the facts in that case relevant to ex parte seizures are, are actually pretty important. We'll be referring back to them later in the presentation. There, the court had previously issued a Rule 65 TRO. The defendant had evaded service of the TRO five times and failed to appear for the preliminary injunction hearing. The court found that the defendant had previously lied about deleting trade secret data. And the court then found that each of the eight requirements for seizure under the DTSA were met, even though the court didn't actually need to analyze each separate requirement. And the court found that the defendant intended to misuse the plaintiff's trade secret information. And even the court's order here is pretty interesting. The court ordered the U.S. Marshal to copy the stolen trade secrets and delete the files from the defendant's computer as soon as possible. But notably, the court didn't authorize a forced entry if the defendant's computer couldn't be seized. So if the defendant wasn't there, if the defendant wasn't allowing entry, the marshal was limited in what he could do. So even when taking a drastic measure, there was a limit to quite how drastic the court was willing to be. We can go on to the next slide. As I mentioned when I was discussing the facts in the Mission Capital case, the defendant there had engaged in some pretty egregious conduct, lying, failing to show up to hearings, which suggests that a history of bad acts on the part of the defendant is necessary to meet the extraordinary circumstances requirement for a TRO. And other courts seem to agree. One example is a case out of Utah, Access Steel Detailing versus Prilex Detailing. There, the defendants had previously attempted to delete information from the computers, and the court found that the defendants had demonstrated a willingness to provide false and misleading information. So again, it seems that a history of bad acts may be necessary to meet that extraordinary circumstances requirement. Keisha, this is Katie Prescott. While I agree with you that a history of bad acts by the defendant appears to be necessary to obtain an ex parte seizure, based on other cases I've seen, it doesn't seem like a history of bad acts is enough to obtain an ex parte seizure. For example, in Henry Schein versus Cook in the Northern District of California, there was a former employee who failed to return her work laptop after she stopped working for the plaintiff access the plaintiff's computer systems after her resignation, and most notably to me, attempted to erase the emails that she had sent from her work computer. Yet in that situation, the court did not issue an ex parte order, but rather granted a Rule 65 TRO ordering data preservation. And then similarly, in Bellaria Caribbean versus Calvo in the Southern District of Florida, there was the uh, former CEO. He had reconfigured his personal laptop to access the company's IT systems. He had inserted a command into the company email system to ensure that all his work email would be secretly forwarded to his Gmail account. And he was conspiring with a competitor while he was still acting as CEO of the plaintiff. And despite that history of bad acts, the court did not issue an ex parte seizure order, but they did issue a Rule 65 TRO. Yeah, I think those cases are really important to note, Katie. The, the truth of the matter is that a lot can be accomplished with an ordinary TRO under Rule 65. In fact, the statute, the DTSA Section 1836B2, 
in talking about ex parte seizures provides that a plaintiff must prove that the defendant would evade, avoid, or otherwise not comply with an order for other injunctive relief, for example, a TRO. So if the results of a DTSA ex parte seizure order can be obtained without one, for example, with a good old Rule 65 TRO, the court might decline to take that extra step. So a lesson here is that if you're applying for a DTSA ex parte seizure order, be sure to specify why no other seizure order would be sufficient. We can go on to the next slide. The most interesting activity in 2018 relating to ex parte seizures, while not actual rulings from district or federal appellate courts, are probably the academic and theoretical debates going on surrounding this clause. In particular, there are two that I'm going to mention during this session. One is whether ex parte seizures can actually be implemented. The other is whether ex parte seizures are even constitutional. So if we can go on to the next slide. When I'm talking about whether DTSA ex parte seizures can even be implemented, it's probably easiest to walk through a couple of examples. So in this first one, the underlying concept was that a thief sneaks into a facility, steals a trade secret, and heads directly to an airport to flee a foreign, to a foreign country. The reality is that it's logistically impossible to use the DTSA ex parte mechanism to stop a thief from heading to the airport. Recall the steps that I mentioned that a plaintiff has to take in advance, arranging for the marshal, arranging for a technical expert, arranging various other logistical details, scheduling pre-seizure briefing. There's just no way for a plaintiff to accomplish all of this if the thief already has possession of the trade secrets and is already heading to the airport. We can go on to the next slide. Here, the concept was that a thief was neatly maintaining all of the stolen electronic trade secrets on one laptop. The plaintiff then identifies that one laptop and the single laptop is seized. The reality is that the very nature of the internet renders it impossible to maintain all secrets on one device or even in one location. Almost inevitably, information is stored in multiple locations on multiple devices or in the cloud accessible by many devices, which then makes it especially difficult for plaintiffs to achieve the first task that I mentioned earlier, describing with reasonable particularity what's to be seized and where it's located. If we can go on to the next slide. On the issue of constitutionality, one concern that critics of the clause have raised is that there's a greater risk of error in ex parte seizure applications under the DTSA than in ex parte Rule 65 TROs. This is due to the fact-intensive nature of trade secret litigation and the difficulty in deciding whether a trade secret exists when there isn't a counter-narrative from the defendant. But Aisha, this is Kane Day. Isn't there a risk of error in any ex parte proceeding? As I understand it, the inquiry here would be sort of a cost-benefit analysis. And trade secrets are unique that the costs of disclosure immediately can be great. Once the trade secret is disclosed, it may be completely destroyed. And doesn't that factor into the calculation for whether this is constitutional? I, I think that's absolutely true. I, I think this is one of the arguments that those defending the statute are raising. The question, I think, is whether or not a court would be or, or can be good at guessing whether or not information is actually trade secret based on an ex parte hearing, and that's difficult to know. And isn't there a concern that there may be some runaway with this, that under Rule 65, if this DTSA ex parte seizures are unconstitutional, wouldn't that also mean that the Rule 65 ex parte seizures could be unconstitutional. I, I think that's a, a very much a possibility. Um, 
you know, risk of error is one of several factors that courts are tasked with weighing when dealing with any type of um, injunction mechanism. So if the DTSA is unconstitutional because of this risk, um, Rule 65 may also be deemed unconstitutional by the same logic. We can go on to the next slide. The other argument raised by critics of the clause is that the physical seizure of computer servers or other data storage equipment increases the risk of catastrophic and cascading harm to defendants and third party vendors. So a few examples here. Um, in our world today, it's difficult to isolate allegedly misappropriated trade secret data from non-offending data. So if you seize a laptop, for example, you won't just be taking the alleged trade secrets, you'll also be taking other legitimate business information of the defendant. And Aisha, again, kind of circling back to the cost benefit analysis that we were discussing on the last slide, are these the type of costs that are appropriately considered in the constitutional inquiry? Because these are costs that apply to third parties, right? Not the individual whose constitutional rights may be violated. Uh, I do think that uh, risk or harm to third parties can be taken into consideration. Um, I should note that one of the elements of 1836 B2 is that plaintiffs have to prove that they'll suffer immediate and irreparable injury without the seizure and that this injury would outweigh any injury the defendant or third parties would suffer from the seizure. Um, plus, um, as I mentioned earlier, a requesting party has to provide a court determined security for any potential damages that might be caused by wrongful or overbroad seizure applications before the court will issue a seizure, seizure order. And that includes potential harm to a defendant or to third parties. So we can move on to the next slide. So what lies ahead? What can we expect to see? As the debates continue, it seems as though Few courts will be eager, let alone willing, to issue this drastic remedy. We can likely expect more debate as to whether this provision belongs in the DTSA, if it can really be implemented, or excuse me, if it can't really be implemented, um, if it doesn't add beyond, much beyond other forms of relief, then why bother leaving it in? This might also lead to questioning of whether the DTSA should be amended with respect to the clause, though the truth of the matter is that few seem to be harmed by its existence. And finally, even if more seizure orders are issued, we should expect them to be narrow because that widely cited ex parte seizure order that I mentioned from Mission Capital, it provided for seizure of a single document, one contact list. And with that, I will hand it over to my colleague, Katie Prescott. Thank you, Aisha. We're going to shift gears now and discuss when and how the trade secrets at issue in a misappropriation case actually get identified. For other forms of intellectual property, identification of the IP that's at dispute in a case is largely a non-issue. In a trademark litigation, the complaint identifies the mark that's allegedly infringed. In copyright litigation, the complaint identifies the copyrighted work that is allegedly infringed. And in patent litigation, the complaint identifies the patent number and the claims that are at issue. Now, the meaning of those patent claims gets further developed through the claim construction process, of course, but the patent claims provide a decent starting point. They define the boundaries of the patentee's property rights, and those boundaries allow the defendant to be able to analyze whether it is using the patented invention or not, and whether that patented invention was previously known in the prior art or not. Trade secret complaints, in contrast, do not typically provide that same useful starting point. Rather, they typically provide only a categorical description of the trade secrets that are at issue. For example, you might say uh, trade secrets related to a meal delivery app software, or an image search algorithm, or a donut recipe. Not knowing the scope of the alleged trade secret at issue makes litigating a case rather difficult. 
the reasonable boundaries of discovery are unclear, and the defendant cannot realistically assess the merits. They can't know whether they're actually using the trade secret, and it's hard for them to figure out whether the alleged trade secret is actually a trade secret or whether it's information that is generally known. The federal DTSA and the Model Uniform Trade Secret Act don't provide any direction on when and how the trade secrets at issue must be identified. So this issue has mostly been addressed in district-specific case law arising in the context of discovery disputes, some of which we'll look at later on. California and Massachusetts, however, have enacted statutes explicitly dealing with trade secret identification. If I could have the next slide, please. In fact, California has had a statutory requirement since 1985 that the trade secret at issue in a misappropriation case must be identified with reasonable particularity before discovery related to that trade secret claim even begins. Next slide, please. And more than 30 years later, last fall, Massachusetts became the second state to have such a statutory requirement. Massachusetts now requires that before discovery on a trade secret claim may begin, the trade secret at issue must be identified with sufficient particularity under the circumstances of the case. This Massachusetts statute also explicitly codifies the motivation behind this trade secret identification requirement. It explains that you need to identify the trade secret first to allow the court to be able to scope discovery and second to allow the defendants to prepare their defense. Next slide, please. Before I step through this slide, I want to alert members of the New York and New Jersey bars that the code for you to obtain your CLE credit is now appearing on the screen. That code is Again, for members of the New York and New Jersey bars, please note that the code for you to obtain your CLE credit is now appearing on the screen. It is. All right, turning back to trade secrets now. Sorry for that interruption. Um, on this slide, I wanted to draw your attention to the fact that late last year in fall of 2018, at the Sedona Conference's first working group on trade secrets, item one on their agenda was drafting language about trade secret identification that could then be adopted as a local rule, much like we have local rules requiring infringement and invalidity contentions in a lot of the courts throughout the country. Like the California and Massachusetts statutes, the Sedona Conference's working proposal suggests that you have a, a written identification of a trade secret by the outset of discovery in a trade secret matter. If I could have the next slide, please. Their proposal then also draws upon the existing case law to attempt to provide some specifics about how to actually go about identifying that trade secret. What is actually enough to identify the trade secrets? They specify various different requirements, including, for example, that each trade secret should be separately enumerated and that documents alone are not a substitute for identifying trade secrets. So you can't just list out a set of documents as your trade secret identification, you actually have to go in and identify the information within those documents that you allege is trade secret. If I could have the next slide, please. The Sedona Conference's working group, in addition to laying out the requirement that you disclose the trade secrets and trying to put some framework around what that requirement entails, recognizes that it can be difficult for a plaintiff to identify the trade secrets at the beginning of a case. They haven't had discovery, they don't know what was taken and how exactly it's being used. And so the working proposal that they have for the local rules would contemplate the possibility of amendment to that initial identification of trade secrets. And they set forth various factors that a court might consider, whether the party was diligent in seeking amendments, whether the defendant would be prejudiced by the amendment, whether it's based on newly information, newly discovered information or information that plaintiff could have obtained right from the get-go, as well as the stage of the litigation. This is very analogous to the concept of serving initial infringement contentions and then, for example, after an unexpected claim construction, a patentee having an opportunity to serve final infringement contentions. 
All right, I'd like to now turn to some examples of how these issues have recently played out in district court. If I could have the next slide, please. Oh, you're already there, thank you. Um, this first set of recent cases that I'm gonna discuss relate to the point that if you're a trade secret plaintiff seeking temporary relief, you'd better go in with a pretty clear identification of your trade secret right from the get-go. The case that's displayed on the slide here is from last month in the Western District of New York. And in this case, Earth Solutions versus Apex Data Solutions. The court denied a TRO because plaintiffs did not adequately identify the trade secret. Um, the Earth Solutions case relates to a software ticketing system that utilities use to manage precautions that are taken when there are excavation projects near buried gas lines. And the user-facing features of the software obviously couldn't be a trade secret because the software users see them, they're not secret. So as shown in this slide, the plaintiff was trying to articulate that its trade secret was instead a unique combination of its system, its architecture, and its user interface. In addition to the language that you see displayed on the screen, the plaintiff had also submitted a declaration under seal identifying its trade secrets, but really focused in those declarations on individual features and describing those individual features in depth. And so in the, the end, the court denied the TRO motion because while well, the boundaries of those individual features had been identified, the court could not determine what combinations of features and functionality the plaintiff was actually claiming to be a trade secret. So before you go in trying to get a TRO, you better figure out what your trade secret is. Um, and the other reason why it's important to know that in advance, not just to be successful in the TRO, is that you might be stuck with that definition for the rest of the case. If I could turn to the next slide, please. In Swarmify versus Cloudflare from last year in the Northern District of California, plaintiff had gone in, made a request for a preliminary injunction, which was unsuccessful, and in that request for preliminary injunction had specified a set of trade secrets. It then, a couple months later, sought to amend that identification of trade secrets. The court, permitted the plaintiff to make that amendment, but put some pretty serious conditions on the option of making those amendments. Those are quoted here on the slide. First, the defendant was still gonna be able to refer to plaintiff's original disclosure to show and argue to the jury that they didn't know what plaintiff's trade secret was. That, you know, This was a case where the sands were constantly shifting. Second, the court was going to require the plaintiff to pay all of defendant's fees for having defended against the defunct list of alleged trade secrets at the preliminary injunction stage. And then lastly, the defendant was gonna have the opportunity to get additional discovery, including repeat depositions, so it could rebuild its defenses, taking into account the revised set of trade secrets. So my takeaway from this ruling is that you'd better like your initial trade secret identification. If I could have the next slide, please. We're gonna switch gears here now to talk about trade secret identification in the context of discovery rather than in the context of preliminary relief. And before I dive into the list of identified trade secrets that are currently being displayed, I wanna briefly mention the case Adia versus Google from last spring in the Northern District of California. In Adia versus Google, the court crystallized what it was looking for in a trade secret identification or disclosure as basically the meets and bounds of the asserted trade secret. And much like the Sedona Conference's working group proposal, the court in Adia explained that listing documents does not provide those meets and bounds. Rather, the court was requiring the plaintiff to go in and identify specific information contained within a list of documents that the plaintiff actually alleged were trade secrets. All right, referring back now to what's actually displayed on the slide here, the Caudill Seed and Warehouse Company versus Jero Formulas Inc. case out of the Western District of Kentucky. Here I've actually displayed and listed out the six trade secrets that were at issue in that case. And I'm actually gonna step through these one by one just to make this a little bit more concrete because 
the identification of trade secrets and what is enough and what isn't enough tends to be very fact specific. The first identified trade secret in that case was research and development related to particular chemical compounds. When the court read that, the court <laughs> told the plaintiff that effectively they were telling the defendant, quote, the trade secrets are the ones we say you took. And I have to say, when representing defendants in trade secret matters, I've often felt that way, that plaintiffs are making a very generic statement and you know, it's sort of, you know what you took and that's our trade secret. Um, the court did not let that suffice in this situation. And what the court ordered here, and this was in the context of moving for supplemental interrogatory responses, the court required the plaintiff to go in and specify the specific chemical compounds, not just say chemical compounds, and then also set forth the processes that are used to isolate those compounds, the, the research and development efforts surrounding that. The second trade secret that the plaintiff identified in Caudill Seed was its general manufacturing process that was set forth in one of its provisional patent applications. And here, this Kentucky court actually found that that was sufficient. Um, you know, that strikes me as odd given that a patent application typically includes not only a description of the invention, but also a background section where you're talking about the prior art, and that obviously wouldn't be something that would be considered trade secret. So it strikes me as an odd ruling, and it also strikes me that um, you know, in the Northern District of California, at least as it's been set forth in Adia versus Google, that sort of document identification would be insufficient. And you'd have to actually call out the sections of that provisional patent application that describe the alleged trade secret. All right, the third category that was identified in Caudill Seed as a trade secret was the precise process for spray drying myrosinase. The court here said that you can't just say the precise process, you actually have to detail what that precise process is. And so the court ordered Caudill to specify in its interrogatory response the times, the quantities, the temperatures, and the pressures that were used in that process so that both the court as well as the defendant actually knew the boundaries of what the alleged trade secret was. Similarly, with respect to vendor information, as well as customer pricing and sales data, the court did not find that just categorically identifying these types of information was sufficient for purposes of responding to interrogatory responses seeking identification of the trade secret. The court required the plaintiff to actually go and name the names of those vendor, vendors and specify the numbers for the prices and for the sales and provide that particularity. Overall, the recent cases that address what is a sufficient trade secret identification show that the inquiry remains very fact specific as well as jurisdiction specific. I do think, however, that the 2018 Massachusetts statute, as well as the discussion at the Sedona Conference about trade secret local rules, are useful developments to encourage putting some structure around the timing and process of trade secret identification. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Kane Day, to discuss damages. Thank you, Katie. And we're gonna talk predominantly now about trade secret monetary relief. And more generally, compensatory damages and damages are highly fact intensive. So the majority of the cases that happened during 2018 focused on calculating damages based on the specific facts of each particular case. So instead of wading through particular factual information related to damages in one case, we're going to take a more academic or theoretical perspective, quite similar to Asia's discussion in, ex, in the ex parte seizure portion that focused on some of the academic questions that surrounded that seizure provision of the DTSA. 
Generally, trade secrets provide for several different types of monetary relief, primarily compensatory damages, which would include lost profits. In addition, they provide for unjust enrichment damages, which includes disgorgement that measures the benefit to the trade secret defendant rather than the harm to the trade secret plaintiff for compensatory damages. Additionally, statutes often provide for a reasonable royalty which measures a hypothetical negotiation between a willing licensor and licensee at the beginning of the alleged misappropriation. Furthermore, there are several categories of special damages, which include exemplary damages. Courts often are permitted to double the compensatory damages and attorney's fees for both parties, depending on the specific facts of each case. Could we go to the next slide, please? Compensatory damages is where we'd like to start. Compensatory damages are generally, as a matter of principle, aimed at returning the plaintiff to the position they would have occupied but for the loss. Could you continue on to the next slide? The UTSA provides for compensatory damages in Section 3A. Largely, most states have adopted the UTSA as governing their trade secret law. However, trade secret law is governed by state law largely beyond the Defend Trade Secrets Act, which was recently passed. So state law can vary and does vary, particularly in New York and North Carolina, and until last year, Massachusetts, which had not adopted the DTSA. This provision provides generally for damages sufficient to compensate the plaintiff for the loss. And if we go on to the next slide, there is a particular provision here that reflects the calculation of damages. This is somewhat unusual in that damages statutes often merely provide for sufficient remedies to compensate the plaintiff. But in the UTSA, they specifically call out two different camps of monetary relief. First, the actual loss caused by misappropriation, which is analogous to the compensatory damages that we were mentioning earlier in the presentation, and unjust enrichment, which overlaps with the disgorgement damages. Here, the statutory provision explicitly provides for non-duplicative adding of actual loss and unjust enrichment to the defendant. And if you continue on to the next slide, more generally, as I mentioned briefly earlier, compensatory damages focus on the but-for rule. And that's the fundamental principle of damages is that it should, they should restore the plaintiff to a position as nearly as possible to the position they would have occupied but for the wrong of the other party. And if you continue on to the next slide, we will apply that concept to the concept of trade secret misappropriation. The Buffalo rule essentially combines two factors. One, determining exactly what the wrong is, and two, determining what occurred as a result of that harm and what the world would be like had that harm never occurred. For trade secrets, the harm is misappropriation. On the slide is re reproduced the DTSA section that defines misappropriation. However, in short, misappropriation generally requires an act and a mental state. Under subse um, subsection little i, it talks about acquisition of a trade secret. That's one of the potential acts that can give rise to trade secret misappropriation. The other two general categories of acts are contained under su subsection little two. Disclosure or use of a trade secret can also give rise to trade secret misappropriation. And generally, disclosure, use, and acquisition must be combined with a mental state. You must essentially do something wrong. Generally, that amounts to constructive knowledge that 
the trade secret was either acquired through improper means or kept through improper means or that you intentionally acquired the trade secret from someone that owned it and had proper possession of it. Now that we've defined the wrong, we continue on to the next slide to talk a bit more about the concept of a but-for world. A but-for world is essentially the nearest possible world where the wrong didn't exist. And I think an analogy to draw here is the concept of the butterfly effect. One small change, or maybe one big change here, and the misappropriation that a defendant takes of a plaintiff's trade secret could have many different varied impacts. The, DT the UTSA statute accounts for two of these impacts by providing for actual losses and providing for unjust enrichment damages. But in trade secrets, it's not always clear exactly how the but-for world would fall out if the misappropriation didn't occur. There are several different options for a defendant to take rather than misappropriating the trade secret. They could attempt to design around. They could attempt to reduce their own costs or gain the benefits that it, the trade secret has without access to the trade secret. They could also seek to license, and this connects up to the concept of reasonable royalty damages. Reasonable royalty damages somewhat assume that the plaintiff and defendant would have negotiated a license ex ante for the trade secret. Additionally, the trade secret defendant could have simply exited the market or operated in the market at a disadvantage. And it's not especially clear what each trade secret defendant would have done would they have not misappropriated the trade secret, which makes calculating this but-for world somewhat different. And if we continue on to the next slide, I want to apply this distinction between but-for worlds and distinction between how courts could possibly calculate damages to a particular case, E.J. Brooks Co. versus Cambridge Security Seals. This is a Court of Appeals case from 2018, Court of Appeals of New York case from 2018. The plaintiff, E.J. Brooks, was asserting a trade secret for a fully automated process for manufacturing plastic indicative security seals. And interestingly, this draws a close parallel to one of the trade secrets that Katie identified in her identifying trade secrets section. There was a requirement for identification of the precise process for developing a chemical. And here, E.J. Brooks probably would have had a similar requirement to identify the trade secret with particularity, at least sufficiently such that a jury could find that the trade secret was misappropriated. And if you could continue on to the next slide. This case actually started in federal court. There was a suit filed in the Southern District of New York and trial occurred based on claims that arose under New York law. And before, at the very top of my section of the presentation, I mentioned that New York law is actually governed not under the UTSA's statutory requirements. Instead, New York law follows the common law structure for developing its trade secret relief. This, claim, this case had three claims, one of which was trade secret misappropriation, but there were also unjust enrichment claims and unfair competition claims. And most, we're going to focus here on the trade secret misappropriation claims, but the plaintiff did win on all three of those claims. The damages theory that the plaintiff forwarded was one of avoided cost damages. They attempted to show that the defendant had avoided certain costs that they would have had to take in order to develop the trade secret through proper means, whether that be through reverse engineering or independent development. That case was appealed partially on the damages theory to the Second Circuit. 
The Second Circuit, rather than wading in to doing an eerie prediction of the New York state law on whether avoided cost damages would be appropriate for trade secret misappropriation, unjust enrichment, and unfair competition, certified three questions to the New York Court of Appeals. And that is how the E.J. Brooks case arose. If you continue on to the next slide, the majority in E.J. Brooks held that avoided cost damages were not appropriate under New York common law for trade secret misappropriation. And essentially, the majority structured a narrow but for rule that was in part informed by some general principles of remedies. As I mentioned earlier, the general principle overarching over remedies is to return the plaintiff to the position where they would have occupied but for the wrong. The majority here focused on the fact that that general principle of damages is plaintiff centric. So using avoided cost damages, which are necessarily defendant centric, is one step removed from calculating the plaintiff's actual harm to move the plaintiff to a position they would have occupied but for the wrong. And this decision focused largely on the general principle of but for harm and a narrow construction of what a but for world is. Kane, this is Katie Prescott. Um, because this was under New York common law as opposed to the UTSA, does that limit the precedential value of this E.J. Brooks opinion? Yes, Katie, that's a good point, and it draws back to the statutory text that I had before where the UTSA indicates explicitly that, that damages allow both for calculation of avoided cost damages and for calculation of actual profit damages. But I do think there is some interesting precedential value of E.J. Brooks beyond its direct holding. In reasonable royalty calculations, you're still having to determine what the appropriate but for world is and whether the reasonable royalty should account for the harms to the plaintiff in a narrow way or in a broader way should attempt to calculate what the value of the trade secret itself is. And I think that distinction will still be able to take a lesson from E.J. Brooks, which is cabined in New York common law and New York common law principles and extend it beyond the text of the E.J. Brooks holding to precedential value that may indicate at least tangentially the implications for the construction of but for worlds on reasonable royalty damages and possibly even compensatory damages under the UTSA, DTSA, and other state law. And I think that transitions nicely to my next slide, which is aimed at describing what the dissent was. E.J. Brooks was not a unanimous holding. It was actually 5-4 a deeply divided Court of Appeals of New York divided over what the construction of the but-for rule should be. As I mentioned, the majority focused on a narrow but-for world, but the dissent focused on a significantly broader but-for world. And it was focused predominantly on additional remedial principles that looked to having a right for every wrong and full compensation. It's not about necessarily cabining the calculation to the dissent on the plaintiff's harms, but more broadly, it, the dissent was aimed at compensating the plaintiff for the trade secret that it lost. So it was the dissent attempted to, by combining avoided cost damages with compensatory relief to fully compensate the plaintiff for the entire trade secret value that it lost. And I think one provision of the dissent's opinion is especially clear on this point. After setting out on the next slide, after setting out its general opinion, the dissent goes into exactly how it would recommend the 
value of the trade secret be calculated. It says, in other words, if the defendant could have independently developed the trade secrets at a cost of X, that would be the avoided cost damages, in a period of Y years, and the plaintiff recovers X plus the profits lost during Y years. So that is the compensatory relief, lost profit damages. The Y years due to the defendant's early entry made possible by the theft, the plaintiff would be put in exactly the position. That is, the, the dissent is attempting to compensate for the full value of the trade secret. So the plaintiff would have put, been put in exactly into the position it would have been had, it, had the defendant not stolen the trade secret. Kane, this is Aisha Bandabadhyay. It seems to me like the dissent's rule should govern. Trade secrets derive their value from not being generally known or readily ascertainable through proper means. When a competitor or any other entity gains access to a trade secret, that secret immediately loses its value. To only compensate the plaintiff for their actual lost profits would undercut fundamental principles of remedies, a right for every wrong, and full compensation, such that misappropriation and ascertaining through proper means are economically equivalent. Plus, compensating based on the trade secret's value is consistent with patent law. There, there are assumptions about validity and infringement that are applied to the calculation of a reasonable royalty. Essentially, those assumptions remove a discount factor from the hypothetical negotiation that would otherwise result in undercompensation. Yeah, Aisha, I think that makes a, a lot of sense. I think those points about the other fundamental concepts of remedial relief are especially salient here because the dissent is very focused on that, on balancing multiple somewhat competing concepts of remedial relief, but the majority focuses on the one plaintiff-centric remedial principle that we should focus on the harm to the plaintiff rather than the benefit to the defendant. And I think the UTSA recognized some of those concerns that you raised in accounting explicitly for the unjust enrichment damages that would bolster the calculation of damages to make it equivalent to the value of the trade secret. And if you continue on to the next slide, we have finished the content portion of our presentation. And if you haven't already done so, please go ahead and submit any questions. If you prefer, you can also contact, contact us personally after the webinar. And if you continue one more slide, we'd just like to thank you. And as I mentioned, uh, you can contact us with any particular questions and um, we will be able to respond to those via email or via phone. Our phone numbers and emails are listed here on the final slide. Uh, we like to thank you for attending the webinar. We'll post an on-demand replay within 48 hours at fr.com. If you have any questions regarding CLE credit, email Fish's MCLE team at mcle at fr.com. Visit fr.com for more information. Thank you.